your Bibles the book of Luke, please. Luke chapter 7. Luke was a Greek boy that came and became a Jew, a proselyte, and then became a Christian. He was also all the time a medical doctor. And unlike Matthew, Mark, and John, he didn't write his account of what he saw the life of Jesus to be. But he took several people's accounts, and he reconstructed very carefully, as any doctor educated person would, a careful account. And chronologically, most theologians will agree that Luke has put it together admirably with careful timeline and careful order and correctness. John was, of course, very close to Jesus. He had his head against the breast of Jesus, wrote his book quite, quite later in life. A lot of the philosophy, preaching, insights was invested in that book. But Luke was historically... And clearly, very clearly, a very accurate book. I always found that very interesting. Like I said last night, I talk, always talk these things to inspire you and stir you up to be interested in your Bibles. It's the most important book of your life. In the book of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36, we read these words. And I read from the NIV. If they put it on the screen, it's an NIV, new interesting version. Now, one of the Pharisees, there were five major groups at the time of Christ, Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, and the Pharisees were very religious leaders. Sadducees were like them. They just didn't believe in the resurrection. The Zealots were the extremists. They were absolutely fanatical about everything, and of course, you know that John the Baptist was amongst that group. In the time of Christ, I don't know if you're interested in hearing these things, there was, a, there was a, a real division in Jerusalem in the temple. And a group were, felt that, they, that the Pharisees and the Levites were becoming very compromised and very carnal. So they split away and they became a very avid group known as the Hessians. And they moved down and they started a monastery down at the, and I'm saying moved down physically 3,000 foot lower than Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about just over 2,000 feet above sea level, and the Dead Sea is 1,000 feet below sea level. And they started a monastery called Qumran, close to the Dead Sea. And that's where we find so many references to John the Baptist. He spent a lot of time in this Qumran area. The Qumran is also responsible at the time of Christ to reproduce while these mo monasteries, these people dedicated to prayer and fasting and seeking God, they they actually reproduced the Bible, 24 books that the Jews celebrate. They, that's how, they, how many books are in the Jewish Bible. And uh, they didn't reproduce all 24, but only 23. They felt Esther wasn't spiritual enough. They didn't mention God and Esther, so they didn't reproduce Esther at all. There were 50 copies of Genesis, though. There are 13 caves, as you may know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that's where they found all these different scriptures, and I thought you might find that interesting. I just want you to be interested in the Word of God that's very much part of your life, right? All right, thank you. I could tell you more about that, but we'll move on to this particular scripture and about the Pharisees. They were hypocritical according to Jesus because they put yokes on the rest of the population that they themselves couldn't keep. They were very much the law enforcers, spiritual law enforcers. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And even though he didn't like what they stood for, he often fellowshiped with them for, because he reached out to them, he loved them, even though he didn't like what they stood for, and they were always had the best food. And so because they were more wealthy than most, and it was a social thing, that if you invite someone that's controversial or well spoken of, it would really make you popular amongst your friends. So this man invites Jesus to this house, and so the Lord reclines at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town Learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed him and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. And what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you, Simon. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. 
One owed him 500 denarii, the other owed him 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but the woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head, but she she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven you. It's always been a very precious account to me, this story, because of God's great forgiveness. I was born again when I was 13. I got born again in a very Pentecostal church. I've come from a Jewish family. I heard the gospel for the first time when I was 10 by a child evangelist who was invited to our school. And I was roped into Sunday school because of it. And I heard about the Lord and things and God and kingdom. And finally, after three years, I was asked to come to a church service where for five Sundays, they preached the hell out of me and I got saved repeatedly. <laughs> I cried my way to salvation every time. It was so real for me. It was the most, most euphoric feeling I've ever had in my life. He's so real to me. And I'm not only grateful today that he has forgiven me of all my sin, written my name in the land's book of life, I am deeply grateful for the ongoing relationship I enjoy with him. He is my friend, my Lord, my Savior. He's my Father. He's everything I could ever want. I am high on life. Since I got born again, since I was 13, I have been extremely content and happy. Nothing you could offer me could make me more happy than I am knowing him. I I really don't, don't feel lonely. He's my Lord and amazing Savior. But I wasn't saved from sin. When we would have youth meetings, they would get line up and they would tell, each one would tell of the terrible things they did before they got saved, and one was worse than the other. It was almost like a competition to see who was the, who was the baddest or the worst. And I would get up and I didn't have much of a testimony. I got filled with the Holy Ghost and very on fire for the Lord. And then, after I knew all that and full of God, then I sinned and made many mistakes in my life. And I come to find out that the Lord not only forgave me, He didn't change one iota towards me. And I fell deeply in love with Him. And so this message is very, very t- close to my personal heart. This woman, the scripture says, lived a sinful life. It very clearly isolates her with these words, unlike the rest of the population. And if in that town she's that well known for the sinful life she's living, I have to ask myself, what was she doing that everybody knew that she was blatantly a sinner? There's only one vocation that she could have had that would have made it that obvious she was a prostitute. I had a friend who died a couple of years ago who was very well known, a singer and a songwriter, Donna Summer. She's a woman of God, and I've known her for many years. And one of the songs she wrote was Bad Girls, Sad Girls. And she was telling me one day when I was visiting with her where that song came from. She lived at several homes, and one of the homes in California she was staying, and her friend had been arrested crossing Sunset Boulevard and mistaken for a prostitute. And she called Donna to come and rescue her. And when the two of them rode down that street, they saw these prostitutes, and her heart went to them, and uh, she said that that was someone's daughter, someone, they're bad girls, and, but they're so sad. And she wrote that famous song for those who are older and might remember that song. And it touched my heart, and I realized, I began to think about, because I have three girls, that it's that someone's daughter. And being a Jewess, it's not an easy thing to become, just to become a prostitute. You graze in the ways of God to have fear and respect for the Lord and respect for your family. It's not an easy thing to start a career like that. And you wonder how that actually happened in her life. How did she get there? Nobody chooses 
to become the way they are. No one says, wakes up one day, you know, I think I want to be gay. No one wakes up one day and says, you know, I want to be a drug addict and I want to go to prison. When I, talk to, when I minister to children at schools and I ask them what they want to become when, they, when they're grown up, no one ever says that, I want to be a prostitute. No, they want to be a fireman or a doctor. They want to be something special. No one has plans. Those, it was never God's plan. Not one person ever planned those things. The Pharisee so easily put her, her in a category what kind of woman she is. We all too quickly want to categorize or judge people and assess them by their life and where they've been. And the mistakes you've made is not who you are. The mistakes you've made. Please understand that. Very important. And this woman, somehow she got into this life, and I began to wonder how that could possibly have happened for her. She must have been beautiful. You couldn't, you couldn't be a prostitute if you weren't attractive. So that was already an, an issue, and I'm sure that she came from a small town and wanted to go to the, make it big in a big city and look for a job, and Dad probably told her, begged her not to go, but she went anyway, set out, and she met some people the wrong Friends. It's always the friends, it seems to me, that introduce you to things you didn't really want to be introduced to. And you want to be cool, you don't want to lose sight. And before long, she was part of a party atmosphere and people that introduced her to her, this kind of lifestyle, and she was getting paid for it. She was the new kid on the block and popular as could be. She liked the attention and it grew until finally word got back to her father in that small village what was going on. And he made his way, long trek it was, there was no trains or cars or buses, made his way there and he began to look for her and he begged her to come home. And she would not want to lose face or be embarrassment of her friends and she wouldn't and I could see like a Jew would to tear his garment because his child is now dead to him. His heart is broken and I could see in her heart how she would feel when that thing would happen that would tear that garment, how hard it would be for her. And so... There she was just carrying on partying and a whole life was the one big fun thing until like every sin, it ages you, it messes you up, but it's not fun. It is not fun. We have an epidemic in the church today of pornography. When I was a child, pornography was very hard to come by. Today it's on your phone. And a lot of Christians have been hooked onto it. It's like a drug. I've come to find out and heard many teachings on it, and it's, a, it's addictive and progressive. It gets a hold of people and they begin to watch it, and they go from one level to the next, and, and, they, and the shame that hits them, and then they, it's like a drug. They have to keep going back to it, and they keep repenting, and the devil holds them with such shame. It's a real epidemic in the church, and they don't want to be, and they're bound. The devil doesn't want you to get free. Half of your deliverance, in fact, more than half, is your confession. We confess, well, I've been doing this. You don't confess the whole thing for fear. And the devil tells you, if you tell them everything, they're not going to like you. People won't respect you anymore. No, they'll, you'll be such an outcast. And the devil lies to you because while he can keep information stored up or hidden, and got you, he can always shame you and keep the guilt going in you and keep you less potent spiritually. But confession, we read in the Scripture that if we confess our faults one to another, we will be healed. The Catholics have got it down to a fine art, to, and I thank God for the Catholics because you've always had telegram, and telegraph, telephone, but tele-Christian <laughs> is the fastest way to spread information. Tell them in confidence, and you've hardly finished speaking, and it's already known by the whole world. And that should not be, it ought not to be. The Catholics have got that thing down. You can confess anything and everything, and you know it will never go further than that booth right there. We ought to be more like that, without judgment, and we had let people get healed. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, stay with me. This woman had fallen into this pit, and sin had gotten to mess her up, like every other sin does to all of us. It gets a hold of your soul and steals everything. The devil's come to steal, divide, and destroy. He's a destroyer. Nothing he offers you is good for you. Nothing. Are you listening to me? And so this woman had gotten into this hole. She never planned it. It was never her dream. She didn't want this. But she was getting older, and she was brushing her hair, and her clientele were getting less and less because she was getting old, and there was no way that anybody in that town was going to marry her. They all knew her. She didn't go to church. She had already built up a resistance 
in her conscience to that because she saw how hypocritical the Pharisees were. They come late at night. They leave their perfect families to come visit her at night. So she didn't, she had all that justification in her that she did. She was more spiritual than they were, as often people do to try and justify their lifestyles. And so she was getting older and she knew she wasn't going to get married and she damaged herself so many times with birth control the way they did it in those days that there was no chance of her ever having a family. Somehow there wasn't much of a future for her. And one morning, it was her turn to go down to the grocery store. They took turns and the way they dressed when walking down that street, they were so noticeable that mothers would take their kids and bring them into the house and people would turn from them and not talk or be quiet when she walked into the courts or courtyard into a store and Indeed, she didn't care, but she knew all this. You can judge me, but you don't know. Your husband comes to me late at night. I know your husband. I know you, all you guys, are all hypocrite, hypocrites. He came so easy to stand that side of the fence. And then as she's buying groceries, she hears about this man. They all talk in the main talk. She, he was a few, few aisles over talking about this man from Galilee, a man from Nazareth, no less. And this man was healing the sick and preaching and speaking of a kingdom. And she kept listening and she thought, I know these hypocrites, another one of these preachers. And she purposed in her heart to go out there and listen to him talk. And she was going to make fun of him. She got just close enough into the hearing of his voice. A lot of crowds of people were there outside of the, town, of the village. And he was talking, love your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you. When someone strikes in your cheek, turn the other cheek. And she was getting more angry in her heart as he spoke because nothing made sense to her. And she went away muttering after being hours listening to him talk. And that night she could not sleep. She turned one way and the other. The words kept resounding in her spirit. Nothing she thought she would have heard that the hypocrites would preach about righteousness. He, she, he preached such a different loving message. She could not even process that. So she decided the next morning she's going to get there early and sit right in the front. She's going to glare at him. And she got there. Sat right there in the front. When Jesus came on the scene and the crowds began to follow him and get gather around him, he began to teach. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you'll be satisfied. She stared at him and he looked right back into her eyes. And there was something about his eyes. They weren't condemning, but they looked right into her soul like he knew everything. She felt everything about her. Nothing was hidden. She wanted to look away, but she couldn't. She didn't feel condemned, but she knew he was looking into her soul. Those eyes, and with such love, he had not experienced any man looking at her like that. She sat there all day until the sun set and Jesus finally went away. And day after day, she'd go out in that field looking for him and be there first to hear the teachings. Day after day, she'd listen to those things and it began to wash her on the inside. She didn't know that. And, and her clothes began to change and her behavior, and she made excuses, didn't want clientele. And, and the girls began to complain. She wasn't contributing financially anymore and she had nothing. And it was some weeks now and something had changed on the inside of her. Words of life had come. He had said things to her and given her hope that there was a future. And she decided that this is not for her. This is not her life. Her, his words had washed her so much that she thought, I'm going to go home to my dad and I'm going to see maybe he might forgive me. If I can, if I can just serve him, maybe I can find some, some reconciliation. And so she began to gather her clothes and her things. And as sin does, it leaves you very poor. And she found in the bottom of a drawer this very expensive perfume that they kept for special clientele. They would perfume the bed and make up the room in a special way for the more the men that paid. They paid more, they got more. And he kept that she was keeping it for a special client, and it was very expensive. She thought, you know, I, I'll sell this, and I'll find my passage home. And that's what I'll, I'll use this. I'll get home with this. I'll find a way to do this. And so she got all the things together in a little bundle, and she walked out the door, and she find, went to the place where he was preaching because she thought, I must just tell him, Thank you. And, and what, it, what his words have meant to me, it, it's changed me inside. I, and she looked so different that even when she walked down the street, people didn't turn away. They, they didn't react to her anymore. She looked so different that people didn't know it was the same person. Something had washed her on the inside. 
She reached the place where he preached and he wasn't there. He didn't come. She ran back to the village and asked, where is this Jesus? Where is he? And they said, well, apparently he's down there at Simon the Pharisee's house having dinner there. And she knew Simon. She knew where he lived and she made her way down there because she, she had to say something. She could not leave without saying thank you, something. So she began to recite to herself, I've come to thank you because no man has ever loved me like this. No one made me feel this way. No one's ever given me kindness the way you have. Nah, it's too corny. What can I say? She tried so much reciting what she's possibly going to say. She went down to Simon's house and all his guests were there. She didn't go in the servant's entrance. No, she went straight through the front door. And nobody asked her for her invitation. Are you invited? Are you one of the guests? What are you doing here? And she walked right past Simon who knew her. And he didn't dare ask her, what are you doing here? For fear she might say, Simon, how's that mole on your left shoulder? Still bothering you? Too afraid that you might expose him. You walked right past him. And she was going to go to Jesus and say, thank you. And that's those eyes. Again, looking straight into her soul, knowing everything, yet no condemnation. Such love. She couldn't turn away and she couldn't find words. And she began to weep. It wasn't tears of sorrow. It wasn't tears of, of repentance. It was tears of such gratitude. And it was a, a form of worship. She was so grateful. And she began to weep and weep and Embarrassed, she was wetting him, so she fell down, and her beautiful hair covered his feet, and she began to wipe his feet with her hair. And then the words came, not words, but gratitude, and she began to kiss his feet. It was the only way she could talk, the only way she could say, thank you for what you've done for me, Jesus. Thank you that you've loved me and, and made a way for me and given me new life. Kissed his feet, and then, then she remembered the perfume. It's all she had, but she wanted to give something back to him because he's given her so much. So he took the bottle and she broke it open and the perfume filled the air and she poured it all over him. Simon really had him there to check him out. Perfect opportunity. And he thought to himself, if you really were a man of God and a prophet, <laughs> he'd recognize what kind of woman she is. Because in his hypocritical mind, he wasn't a sinner, only she was. And Jesus, gracious even to him, even to his hypocritical way, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, sir, go ahead. One man who was a moneylender owed, had two men owe him money. One owed him $500, the other owed him 50 Neither could pay him, and if he gave both, they did. Which one do you think would be more appreciative? I guess the one who had the most given. Why is the you've answered? And he expresses about this woman, and she doesn't, he doesn't get it, I don't think, the whole message that she forgiven. He came into the house. It was tradition and normal for, if you honor your guest, to give them water or to wash his feet. And it's normal to greet them with a kiss. It's normal to even perfume them. It's all to honor people. They gave him no honor because he was forgiven little or wasn't forgiven at all, where she was forgiven. And this the salvation message of the, this wonderful gospel it is the most amazing message. An Australian girl came up to me when I was preaching there. I've been there often. And she's come to me and she's asked me, how do I know what you're preaching is true? How do I know your message is right and your version of this Bible is correct? I said to her, if what I'm preaching is not true, it's not real, there is no God, and you follow this way, when you die... You've lost nothing. In fact, you've had a wonderful life. If what I'm preaching is true, however, and you don't follow it, you've lost everything. You've got nothing to lose. It's a win-win situation. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 2 says, How shall we ever escape if we neglect such a great salvation? There are so many religions on earth today, and they all have many interesting things to offer. But there's only one religion that offers you a gift, a free gift of salvation and constant redemption, forgiveness, constant, that he will never cast you down or leave nor forsake you. There is just no message on this earth like it. You've got to be brain damaged not to want to embrace this wonderful salvation. 
And we cannot keep it to ourselves. We cannot be a secret service Christians. We have to tell someone every day about God's love. Not everybody will receive it, but we've got to tell them for those that will, that they have the opportunity to hear this good news of salvation, a way that He has made. An amazing salvation. This woman's life was revolutionized. She was forgiven so much sin. The love in her heart was overwhelming. When we've been born again and we lived a life of made so many mistakes and we realize God forgave us all, it makes us honor and appreciate Him and want to worship Him. It is a wonderful truth. He's so real. The Lord God Almighty is real. He hears your prayers. He cares about you. You cannot assess God's approval of you by your circumstances or your life's situations. You cannot be that immature that you can determine things happening to you as God doing it or what all these different spiritual activities. <clears throat> Please understand that God does not change. His words are true. If He says He loves you and He's for you, there's nothing you can do to change that. He is faithful. You cannot evaluate God's approval by your circumstance. Must have done something wrong. This is happening to me now. No, no. In Acts 28, we find our brother Paul with a snake hanging from his hand. And the people on the island who don't even know him say, he must have been a very bad man. He escaped the storm, but the snake got him. He must just have got a hold of him. They, people immediately assume when something bad happens to you, you deserved it. It's not true. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. You can know God by His Word and your relationship, not by your circumstances. Because when things go wrong, God's not mad at you. Things, God has not changed. Are you listening to me? He loves you so intensely. And if you will draw near to Him, He will draw near to you. You must pursue Him and want Him and long for Him. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness is not sinlessness or blamelessness. Righteousness is right standing with God. He's a gift of salvation, a gift of righteousness. God's love for you. He loves you so much. It, and if you hunger and thirst, you want to have a relationship and be in right relationship with Him, you are blessed because you will be satisfied. That's God's promise to you. He will satisfy you. Are you listening to me? Of all those blessed Beatitudes, there's only one that has a promise in it of itself. Blessed are you when you show mercy, because you'll get mercy. And let us make it a habit of our lives to err on the side of mercy with people around us, because we have every reason to be angry and hurt and offended at people. There's always a chance for someone to hurt and wound you, and in your own family, people close to you, people you trust, in the church, you, ex you don't expect it and it hurts you the most. Christians hurt you the most because your expectancy is that they are perfect when you yourself are not. And it's not true. People are human. They make mistakes. And we must show mercy that we can receive mercy. I have one amen and one agreeing with me. It's exciting. I hope you all hear. You must take it down a notch. You're way too excitable in this place. I wanted to, to share this with you about the goodness of God and God's love for you. And because I don't know everybody here tonight, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads just to give everybody a chance tonight to know Him as their Lord and Savior. While every eye is closed, I'm going to ask you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus as your own personal Savior, or you have perhaps given your heart to the Lord but gotten wandered off a little bit and you're not in the place you should be and you want me to pray a prayer of faith I'm not going to call you forward I'm not going to embarrass you I just want you to slip your hand up while every eye is closed that I can see the hand and pray for you I want you to raise your hand quickly and say please Ed, pray for me one, two, any more hands three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight hands have gone up put them down again please thank you All right. because of the eight hands I want everyone to pray out loud with me now to help those that raise their hands not bringing you forward just where you are all of you pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I confess my sin and I ask you to wash me in the blood. Come into my heart and into my life and be Lord and Master. I surrender all to you and receive forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord, 
that from this moment onwards, you will guide me and lead me in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Father, I pray for those that raise their hands, those that, that have never given their hearts to you, that as they pray that prayer, it will become a reality. Father, I ask you that you let them feel you even now, and that the Spirit of God, will, what has begun tonight, will continue, that they will grow in you, them and their household, their families, their entire family, Lord, be saved. I pray for those that put their hands up that, do know you, but they've gotten cold that you put a new fire in their hearts, Lord, a new zeal, because they're putting their hands up, showing that they hunger for you. I pray, baptize them with a new excitement for you, and let them know you, I pray, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm sure all of you have iPhones and iPads and things like that, and let me invite you to our website, propheticlife, propheticlife.com. I have free daily devotionals that I write personally. In fact, I have a, one in book form now at the back. It's available, Life Words, for an entire year. But I write them every single morning. I write Life Words. I write, give you a scripture, three little pointers, a little picture, and a, and a prayer. Take you maybe 30 seconds to a minute to help you in your own walk with the Lord. It's free. It gets downloaded, emailed to your email account, to your phone, wherever you want it. It's uh, propheticlife.com. Totally free. No obligation. Just sign up and be part of that. Propheticlife.com. It's excited with churches. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing in your life's journey took him by surprise. He knew all the obstacles you'll go through. He knew, and this, if you think you've gone through some difficult times, let me tell you there are going to be more. <laughs> Jesus said, in this world, there are many troubles, many. Woo-hoo. But he said, I overcame the world. Is that right? Thank you, Jesus. Let me start with this fellow with a face. What's your name? Jason. Jason the healer. What do you do, Jason? You're the drunk driver? Oh, truck driver. <laughs> I'm so sorry I heard drunk. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Truck driver. Okay, you're like an 18-wheeler? Dude. And this is your lovely wife. What is your name? Tara. Tara. Okay, and, and you are in this church? I'm glad. What do you do, Tara? Um, I'm a teacher. And a good one you are, too. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a prophetic gift on the inside of you. Since you're a little girl, you've got a very keen, sharp uh, discernment. You sense things in the spirit. You just don't know how to work with it yet. But God's going to help you and grow you in that. Uh, the Lord favors you. You know there's something you've got to do. There's something inside of you burning, and, and, and that's the prophetic that you'll bring life to people and words of life, and that's God's plan for you. There's no question. In your journey, your own life, you had a lot of nothing was easy. You had pressure every side and in relationships that put pressure on you. You could never always please everybody all the time growing up, and it was a real journey for you, and God allowed that to give you a confidence and a dependency on Him because He wants you to lean on Him all the time. And you met the fella, and uh, he's a good man. He's an upright man. He wants to do what's right. Jason, God likes you and loves you much more than you think he does. Uh, The devil has not liked you serving God. He's done all he can to distract you. I mean every temptation, every bit of darkness. He wants to put shame and guilt on you, and from this day onwards, no guilt, no shame. Everything that's up to this moment has been forgiven you, and you must walk in that forgiveness. Do you understand? God is your helper and your strength. You need to you need to get on a healthy diet. Your diet is a bit unbalanced. You that radio of yours is listening to the wrong music. You got to get the right stuff. You got to help more wholesome things inside of your spirit, and God will strengthen you. You've gone through phases of your life where you, there was fire there and your zeal, and then there's a dry patch. Now you're gonna stay on an even keel where God's gonna grow you. But what the Lord loves about you, Jason, is your heart and your motivation. He loves that you always want to do what's right. And you always go the extra mile and you always want to stop to help the neighbor, someone you don't even know, to help them along the road. You're always wanting to help. And and you've had to mix some really rough people in your life. And that's been really hard for you. But you don't understand that because you yourself are not deceitful. You're not a liar. You like like truth and you've had to deal with people that are untruthful. And it's been difficult. And the devil has been bidding for your soul. He has tried everything to get you off track. But I'm here to tell you God's hand is heavily on your life. There is 
is no way the devil could ever pluck you from his hand because God favors you. In your own family, someone prayed for you an awful lot and your name has been drenched in heaven by their prayers and you can never escape because those prayers will, will go with you till the day you die. Strong tears of prayers and you, you are God's blessed and favored of the Lord. These are your children. How many kids do you have? Three. Thank God. <laughs> your little girl, what's your, what's your name? Way too adult for her age. She's very, very mature and all grown up and very bossy. <laughs> Tells everybody how they ought to be and what they should be doing. But it's her natural leadership skill inside of her, and she's got a very tender heart, and she's a combination of both, both of you. She has a bit of both of you in her, and uh, she will do really well. She, I, see, I do see uh, her, her in some sort of media like TV or something like that in her life, and she's got some things, real news things, and, and she's very detailed, and, and she, she, there's no gray with her. It's either black or white. She, she wants complete truth, and that's what she's going to be involved in is in news reporting. Okay, and then there's this little fella here. Grayson. 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 Wasn't there another Grayson too in the church? I, was it, did, I meet, did I meet you yesterday? Oh, I met him yesterday. That's what you I met. I remember the name Grayson, combination of Grace and Jason, right? Little, okay, Grayson. He's very smart. He has his father's brains because mom still has hers. <laughs> Grayson's very smart. He doesn't look for trouble. It just finds him naturally. <laughs> he loves that. <laughs> He's very deep, he's got a very tender heart. He asks questions, the most unusual questions at the most unusual times because his heart and soul is really searching for the deep things of God. And God's hands upon him, you gave him to the Lord, the devil tried to kill him and take him out, but God's hand was in from the very beginning for the purposes of God and he will be a preacher. There's no ways of getting around it. Now let me warn you, he can sell you anything. <laughs> he will sell you your own shirt. And he's always got money tucked away somewhere. He'll spend yours and keep his. It's always crafty with that way. But he'll be a good preacher. That's God's plan for him. What is your name with a cutthroat? Jill. Jill, help, help me. Jill. Jill, I'm getting it right, Jill. Are you married, Jill? Yes. You have one husband and how many children? I have two grown. Two grown. Thank you for sharing that. That's your daughter right there? Okay, I spoke to her and her husband last night, right? Is that correct? This morning. I get confused time-wise and so on. So are you, are you in this church? The word of the Lord for you is to leave behind you what is behind you. You're still living a lot in the past and the sorrows and difficulties, and it's holding you back from blessings. Yes, they did wrong. Yes, you were done wrong. It's true. But you're not the only one. Shake it off and really forgive and watch what God will do for you. Do you understand? Your life is not over. The devil told you you're going to die. You're not going to die. You, well, you are going to die, but not now. <laughs> We're all going to die sometime. It's appointed a man wants to die. And then the judgment. The scripture says that. But it's not time for you. It's a long time still. You've got a lot of traveling and stuff to do. You know that you've got a very strong will. You can be stubborn as a mule. And you're stubborn not to die anyway. So let me just tell you about that. You did not a giver upper. And they thought that you were down and out and gone and you wouldn't get up again. And Oh, no. The best is yet to come. That's God's promise for you. Do you understand? The best is yet to come. <laughs> Hallelujah. What's it to you? All right. Susanna, my sister Susan, and don't tell me his name. It'll come to me. Mike. 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 I'm trying to remember names. I'm not good with it. You know, my hard drive is full. I always tell people, I'm not lazy, I'm just in energy saving mode. <laughs> so how many, you have two children still, right? And where's the, where's the other fella? The little fella? On his way. Okay, or just met a girl friend or something. <laughs> so Mike, um, a lot of changes are ahead of you in your life, there's no doubt about it. You, what makes you the champion for God is your integrous heart. You're easily influenced by people you care about, and Susan's very strong. She's naturally a leader, and she can influence you, which is, which is totally fine. Pontius Pilate's wife influenced to try to influence him against not judging Jesus and those things. It's very normal. We are one. But uh, up to a point, when you make up your mind, then you, then you can put your feet so, he'll dig your heels so deep in. 
But what makes you the man of God you are is the honesty, the integrity. Your conscience will not let you do things that are just not right. You are a man that can do many things. You have great capabilities, and you will be an asset always to God's kingdom. It is God's plan to use you not only to financially advance God's kingdom and to orchestrate things of God in this church, other churches. It's all going to grow into very complex, but also to teach. You love it. You love to speak, and it's going to become a real fire in your soul to speak. And you'll speak to businessmen. You'll speak to men's groups. You'll speak to churches. You'll speak because you're just very excitable about those things, which you're born to do. You've got a very good heart and good spirit, but you never dreamed this would happen to you because God had always planned it for you, and he wants you to move right along. Susan, you're coming to a total change of season in your life, and you have to let go. You've got your own ideas. You lay in bed at night, formulating tomorrow, the next week, and where things are going, and they don't always pan out the way you want. God wants you to complete surrender that he can have full control of your life and lead you. The, the saving, wonderful saving grace in your life is you always surrender eventually to the Lord. You always let him have his way because you really love the Lord with all of your heart. You are a, a great instrument. You are prophetic by helping people, you prophetically counsel, work. You have a, a way of just knowing things about people, even the unsaved, that you say the right thing and that people tell you. How did you, why did you say that now? Just out of the blue. You just have an uncanny way of saying the right thing at the right time because you sense things by the Spirit. You're also very sensitive in the natural, and you need to be in command of that. Not let it master you in any way. Let the devil use it to get you excited or offended about anything because you're sensitive in the spirit. Don't be, let the devil work sensitive in the natural. It's, it's that simple. And your young, young fellow son, I forgot his name. Will. Will. Will? Like short for William? All right. And you're 19, right? You're not married yet? Is anybody you like here? Just, just point and click. <laughs> Am I embarrassing you? I'm trying really hard. <laughs> your dad and I like to embarrass kids. We just love it. Yeah. Yep. You'll have your turn one day, believe me. You're very smart. People don't always understand and get you because you talk on such high levels sometimes that you, you assume they understood what you wanted, what you meant, and, and they didn't. So you've got you to dumb it down. You've got to bring it down that they all can get what you're saying. They must communicate on different levels so they're, they're simple and the complex all together in one sentence. And you can do this. You can do this. You have a good heart and a good spirit. You'll have many little hobbies in your life. Uh, and I, I don't know why it's so strong in my spirit, but cooking and, and food will be a part of your hobby in your life. I'd always see in this very, very elaborate kitchen of some kind. And um, just you have this fascination of putting things together. That's been part, part of your life. God made you very unique. You're not like anybody else, and he's hands on you for, to do good, good and wonderful things. Uh, you've gone through different self-image roles where the devil tried to pull you down, but you've built up and become strong again, and there is no way that you'll succumb to a bad self-image. God will be your strength and your helper, right? Just choose your friends wisely, not just Christians, but people that have positive, right spirits. If they wear you down, they're negative, whiny, whiny, separate yourself. Don't be constantly around them. They, you don't need that. You need life, life, right? Okay, dude. Yeah. God's got a wife for you. Her name is, I charge more for those things. I am Jewish, you know. I'm just kidding you. I'm embarrassing you now. He's so shy. Hallelujah. God is good and the devil can go to hell, right? You all agree with that. Thank you, Jesus. What's your name in front of you with the folded arms? David. David. And this is your wife, Bathsheba? Patricia. Oh, Patricia. <laughs> close, close, close. Hi, Patricia. They call you Pat? They call you Trish? What do they call you? Whatever, Whatever works. I'm Ed. My daughter calls me Special Ed. <laughs> so how many kids do you guys have? Two? Seven. Seven. You don't have television? <laughs> What's, you, don't wa you don't watch much? Obviously. <laughs> now, David, I'd ask what you do for a living, but it's obvious, not a whole lot. <laughs> it's wonderful. Seven kids. Is it a combined effort or not? 
It's, it's, it's like the Brady Bunch melted together. Okay. Here's the deal with you, David. I am so sorry, and I apologize to you on behalf of someone in your own family that didn't, didn't strengthen you when they should have. In fact, their words were less than forthcoming. They put you down before they built you up, and they, they were thought they were doing the right thing, but it, it did more damage. And your self-image took such a blow. And you've been fighting to prove them wrong all your life and to be something and not the loser they try to make you out to be. So I apologize on their behalf. They didn't really mean that. It wasn't what they meant. And you're not a loser. Yeah. You are a wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> so I'm asking you to forgive to forgive from your heart, because they didn't really mean it. They, they were just ignorant. It's, it really was. It wasn't intentional. And the devil would love to have used that to hold you back. And then to set you up in your effort to try and prove that you're a success, you had several failures. And let me tell you, God's not stressed by that. You've got to fall down and get up again. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. We of that crowd that keep getting up. And you must get up. Do you understand? Because you can do it. You I tell you the truth, David, you can do it. You're not a giver-upper, and you can make it happen. No matter how many times it fails, get up and do it again. Don't look back what was before. Well, it didn't work, and I don't want to go through it. Yes, you want to go through it again. You're going to do it, and you're going to succeed. Let me tell you, I go to a church, an Assembly of God church in Louisville, Pastor Rogers. Now, his dad is also Pastor Rogers, and this Rogers man, his, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, you ever heard of him, Colonel Sanders, was in his church. He was 65 years old, and he was tired of being so poor that he borrowed money against his second Social Security check, and he started frying chicken, and it worked well for him. So it's never too late. It's never too hard. God can. In fact, the kingdom of God comes in a can, not a can't. God can. I can do all things through Christ. And God's going to give you enormous success. You are going. It was always God's plan to give you wealth. Because he knows that you won't keep it to yourself. You will bless people. You will. And you need to forgive those so there's no retaliation in your heart. Because you've been done wrong by several people. When you really needed them, they were gone. When you had, could help them, they were your friends. And you have this anger in your heart. You need to forgive them because they're just weak. You better than that. You're going to be kind to even the unkind kind people. And God's going to bless you and raise you up financially because you can trade. Boy, you can trade if you really want to. You can get down. You can, you can turn a piece of junk into real success. And you can see the value of those things. And God's going to open up those doors for you. Do you understand? Okay. As for you, ma'am, it's a new day in your life. You live from one day to the next, one day to the next. You, you don't even try to have vision because you're just trying to keep life going in all ways you can. And it's been very tiring for you. What he doesn't know and people don't know around you is you're exhausted. You go to bed tired, you get up tired. But you get yourself, keep going. Because you, it's always who you are. You just keep going. And the Lord wants to refresh you and tell you how much he appreciates you, how he honors you, and put a new song in your heart. Do you understand? Oh, the Lord's telling me right now, whispering my ear, I must tell you, what happened to you was not your fault. You did nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong. This was not you. Don't you take it on you. You've always taken blame and accusation that was never yours. Do you understand? They're so quick to blame you. It's not you. You did nothing wrong. The Lord's favoring you and he's going to bless you. So, you guys are going to prosper. Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Wesleyan, pick some people for me too. Two or three people. Come on. Look for your enemies. How come you carry your blankie with you? Oh, brother. <laughs> Have you got shorts on? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> now, come on. Let the Lord lead you. Get up on your feet and just let the Lord lead you. You're a woman of God. Come on now. You can do it. Um, there you go. There's already Jerry and Jones. Stand up, Mr. Jones. And give one more. Look for a sinner. <laughs> They're all sinners redeemed by grace. Right? I'll let you, Mr. Jones, what's your first name? Jeremy. Jeremy, JJ. Yes. And this here is your? This is my daughter. And your wife, where is she? She needs to take her place tonight. Okay, can someone relieve her, please, for me? Yes. Somebody, please. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, guys. Oh, look at that. all three of them. Wow. What a family of God you are. What a family. That is, that is a wonderful testimony. All right. And what's her name? Do you know? Pardon? <laughs> Debbie? Okay. You know that song, Mrs. Jones? We've got a thing going on. I love that song. It's about his wife. Do you know that? Forget. Forget. So, Debbie, I'm pretty grateful that you married him. It was a dirty job, but somebody will do it, right? <laughs> what do you do, Debbie? And a good one. So thank you for serving us, watching the kids and doing that for us so willingly. Thank you so much. And as for you, Mr. Jones, what do you do for a living? You're a scientist there. God's favors are on you since you were a boy. I don't know what it is about you, but God really likes you. There's just something good and pure and wholesome about you. I can't explain. I don't know you. I just sense in my spirit. You, God's always favored you, always. But he wants a whole lot more from you than you've been giving because he's given you so much to give. You have also an uncanny way of saying the right thing at the right time. And you do, but most of the time you're quiet. You don't want to share. And you need to get more involved and not sit at the back, but become more forward and become more involved that God can really use you and use that wonderful anointing in your life and bless, bless people through you. And uh, you often think, well, they don't need, <laughs> I don't need to tell that. The things come to you and you don't, well, I'm sure they know that anyway. No, no, share it. If it comes to your heart and thoughts, share it. Speak to that person and encourage them. God will use you as an exhorter to bring strengthening and help to people's lives. Um, there's a lot of changes coming in your work arena. You're not going to stay where you are. God's got a lot of things planned for you, going much higher. They, they haven't been doing what they said they would do. They've, you've reached kind of, kind of a ceiling. You haven't really been able to go further than you really can, and you really, you're stuck, and there's those that want to hold you back, but God is opening up doors that no man can shut for you in your own career that you will really do well. You're going to write a lot of papers and books and scientific things. It's all part of God's plan. You have a lot of theses and different things that are very important as different discoveries come and there's things that are inside of you because you don't, you'll never, you haven't leveled out. You're going to keep learning. You're going to keep growing. It's all part of the plan that God has. There's a lot of new industry coming in this whole region that's going to influence where you will work and what you'll do and some of the things you were born to do. How many children do you guys have? Three. Thank God we broke that barrier. Three kids and a good job of, of three kids. You've got wonderful children. You're a very good dad and you're a good communicator and your kids will grow up. They're all very smart and very busy body. They want to know everything and questions and they have insights and they, they gather information and they, not one of them is born to follow. They're all born to lead and it, it's an awkward thing because it'll cause them to compete with each other and cause a little few little sparks as time goes on, but they will they'll love that. There'll always be the competitiveness and it's okay. It's good. It makes them stronger in every way. They're all very, God just assigned you the right kids. He gave, he handpicked them for you. And as for you, my sister, you're a delight to the Lord. You're a very unselfish, giving spirit, very kind heart. You grew up at a young, serving from a very young age in your own home. You served, and God saw how you gave to others and older people and did for them, served them without anybody ever asking you or getting any kind of reward. And he will reward you more than you can ever dream and give you the desires of your heart. He'll bless you. And there's some travel in your life that you always said one day that will be a lot closer than you think, and God will bless it. You're a wonderful team, and your home will become a home of salvation, a home of people to come to get blessed. People will love to come to your home just because there's something there. There's an anointing of love and harmony that's just amazing that's, that is in that household. My sister, in your own family, God is doing some amazing things, and he's healing and fixing some things that are broken in your own family. It's not your job to fix it, and although you'd like to, it's the Lord's job. And all you've got to do is pray. He will do it by his spirit. That simple. Thank you so much for being here, the two of you. Who else did you pick? Yes, two more, but you must do it. Now, who told you now? Who, who is prompting you to do that? By yourself. Okay, go. Amy? And who's the other one? Who? Is it the fella? Carla? Carla K. Hi, Carla K. Okay, so what is your name back there? Amy. Amy, and this is your husband? And you know his name? Mark. See, you did know his name. <laughs> and how many children do you have? It looks like 500. See, we're really a breakthrough. 
It's like a little factory there. They all look this close in age. Do you have twins or no? Wow, you're planning more? We're on a roll now. You might as well stop. You might keep going, right? <laughs> Ooh, eight is enough, I heard. <laughs> He's looking very nervous now. <laughs> you're halfway there. It's just four more. <laughs> so what do you do for a living, my sister? A principal of a school. Yes. Which one? S- there's, a, there's a sleepy hollow here? Yes. Oh my word, I thought that's a show. <laughs> or a book or something. It's actually a school? Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay, and then what do you do, sir? Uh, I'm a guard at Pantix. A guard at Pantix. Okay, that's cool. And you have four kids. A healthy and wonderful family. You are blessed. That's a great blessing. <sighs> You come, both have come a long journey, and always your decision-making was to do what's right, regardless of what the price may be. The two of you have always been in consensus about doing what's right. And you're a teacher, and everything is always uh, organized and ordered with you. But when you married him, you didn't marry any less, because he can also organize and put things through. He takes his time to make a decision. That's what makes him so valuable. He doesn't make impulsive and foolish. He makes very wise decisions. You get excited now, and you want things to happen now, and things upset you, but we know. Oh, she's, get out of her way. She's upset. Things are not right now, but he's more calm. He's upset, but he, you don't know it. He's got a poker face. Won't know it for a while, and he has to think things through, and God gave you a man like that to help you always keep the balance, and he needs you to get, get a little excited because he's very mundane, very predictable, you know, he eats the same thing all the time and same routine. And the Lord wants to spice him up a little bit with you and help you to balance it out with him. So the two of you are a very good team together and an asset to God's kingdom because you have up, utmost integrity and pureness in your hearts and everything you do is for the right reason. You're going to move from the house you're in. There's another home that God has planned for you and it's much bigger than you really asked for. It is really more space than you think you need. It's a lot more air conditioning space to cool and heat and it's God's plan for you. He wants you to have that with a really big yard and all the things that are there for you. Uh, in your own family, my sister, there are things that you wish you could fix and you tried so hard. I mean, you, you are a fixer. You always want to fix a relationship and you always blah, 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 blah. You'll talk it down, you know, if, if there's a, really a thing going on, but you can't fix it all. Some things God has to fix. But you have done right and pleased the Lord in every way. So God's for you. So there's a new house and a new vehicle that God's got planned for you too. He wants to provide for you. He's a good provider and he's not poor, broke, or cheap. He's El Shaddai, not El Cheapo. You know, Jesus never drove a used car. He drove a brand new donkey. It's true. Right? And you've got, these, got a variety of kids. Your kids all have extremely different personalities. Extremely different. They, you're not even sure if they come from the same gene pool. They're so different. They may look similar, but they, their personality is vastly different. For example, this one on my right-hand side, what's his name? With a cowlick? Gabriel? Gabriel is the, is the businessman and the, the clever one, always thinking of some scheme, always got a plan, and he's always hiding his stuff away that no one can mess it with, with it, and he, he wants his own little space, and, and uh, he's always got a plan, and he'll do well in business. The one next to him, what's his name? Micah. Micah is very outspoken. He'll tell you what he's thinking. He's no, well, what's he thinking? He'll tell you, and he'll, he'll, he can... He can uh, make it very clear, but he's got a very tender heart, and he loves the Lord. He's very sensitive to the Holy Ghost, even as young as he is. He's got a real heart for the things of the Spirit. This young lady, uh, she's uh, not bossy, but she's very strong, strong-willed, and and uh, very, wants everyone to be safe. She's got this whole shepherding thing going on in her life. She wants everyone to be protected, and that she thinks it's her personal job to fix even those people in the street, and that's not her job. But it's her nature to want to nurture and take care, and she will help do a lot of what you've done, some teaching, but some, maybe some ministry in years that lie up ahead. And the little one that's around you is the musician, uh, the gifted prophetic musician that's going to be very, oh, this is no slowing down with that kid, let me tell you. It is noisy, it is busy, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it is what it is. Somebody here you said, what's your name? Car K. Hi, Car K. I bet you don't believe in this prophetic stuff. I think this is a bit strange for you, the whole, whole caboodle. But you know, 
what I see inside of you is you're a woman of God. You come a long way with the Lord. And I really appreciate people like you that have always focused and, and been integrous all your life and sought after to do what's right before God, even if it meant you were the only one. And I appreciate it. I feel inspired by people like you that have walked such a long road with God and kept it right, kept it pure and kept it true. I really appreciate that. But the Lord wants to open, open your heart, your mind to new things. And he's got new, he, he hears your prayers. There is no question. And your prayers have great power in heaven. The fervent prayer of a righteous woman, mother, will change everything. I don't know how many kids you have, but I see the Lord moving amongst your kids, especially one that needs a complete change and turnaround. And your prayers have reached heaven in such a way that he's impacting and changing everything around you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Because you've really made an impact and great will be your reward. That's God's promise to you. God bless you. So, are these your friends? Do you have any friends? Yes. <laughs> you guys think I'm weird, don't you? My daughters over here, they'd be so embarrassed with me now. They, they always get embarrassed. So, we, we, are, you, are you the same age? What? Sounds like a choir. And you are younger or older? And much wiser, right? What is your name? Emily. And how old are you? Nine, oh, so much more mature, so much more. And what are you going to do with your life? A cosmetologist is the beauty thing going on. Lord knows I need it, and so does the pastor. <laughs> I need a facelift from the knees up. <laughs> yeah, where's your mom? I was going to say, you've got a great mom, woman of God, and, and uh, she's also going through a physical healing. There's something going on in her body that God's fixing for her and, and extending her years. She's a great little lady and God's hands on his. She's certainly produced good kids. There's no question about that. Um, there is no confusion with you. You know what you want. You don't need people to like you or don't like you. It's their problem and you're going to move right along and you will have your own business. As sure as I live and breathe, you'll have your own business and it won't be one thing. It won't just be beauty. It'll be the whole package, the whole spa, the whole everything that God's got planned. You'll even have a real therapist working in, that, in the same office eventually. It'll be the whole package and it'll be really well known for that. And God's blessing upon you. You already had a disappointment in a relationship already, but God says he will watch over you. You won't make any mistakes and he will make sure that he protects your heart for you. Just keep walking after the Lord. That's God's promise. What's your name? The same age as her? No, same age as her, as I said, right? 17. I said, Stephanie, it's the same age as her. <laughs> Not even blonde. <laughs> so, what are you going to be when you grow up? A mom. A mom. That's, your, that's, your, that's your aspiration? To be a mother. And a good one you will be too. Yeah. Yes, you will be. You have a, an athletic anointing. I don't know if you know that. You have a gift to do sport and athletics. You'll always be involved in something athletic and out there with you coaching whether you're doing something but you always be involved in that i don't know if you like swim but i hear the water and the whistle going on all kinds of stuff in the background that god's got planned for you i don't know if you'll just be mom you're going to go to college or study something i see some studies in your life you may not want to but that's part of god's plan because you need that it's going to build strength inside of you and confidence you're too smart not to use it you're a natural student you learn very fast you know you don't always remember everything but you learn it fast and, and, and he wants you to, to go after that do you understand so go to college. It's going to do you good. Right? Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. How much time do I have? Okay. Are you having fun yet? Yes. I came over here for a reason. I know there was a reason. A reason for the season. <gasps> Show me, oh Lord, I slipped my shoo, slippery mind right out of my mind. What is your name, Grandma? In front of you. You're not, you're not a Grandma? What's your real name? Donna. Donna. That's a good name. Thank you. And are you a grandma? Yes, I have nine grandkids. Well. And, and are, you, are you married? Yes. And you have how many children? Two. Two, of course. You fit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> husband. Yes, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're in this church, right? 
and a very important part you are. You have a natural exhortation gift, natural way to encourage people, and you always have a positive way. No matter how bad the storm looks, you'll always find a way to see something good in it, and you're a real blessing because of it. And you've had so many war zones and health things beating you up, but you just never got negative and laid down, and you always stood up and fought back. And that spirit of infirmity cannot rest on you. Do you understand? Because God, you overcome it, and he promised you a long life. It is your right. You're only halfway, girlfriend. Only halfway. <laughs> God, God can. God can. And you, your work is not yet done. You need to get it, okay? Work is not yet done. Thank you, Jesus. Good God. You, you came back tonight, didn't you? You weren't going to come back, right? Was it you? Well, you came back like last night. What's your name? What's your name? Louise, even the trees whisper Louise, that one. And you are married? Yes, of course I am, right. Do you know, do you, 40 years, and, and how many children did you say you had? Seven. That's right, seven kids, okay, good job. It was a special on Walmart. <clears throat> yeah, that's where you found them, yeah. Um, you've labored hard and, and very unselfishly in God's kingdom, and a lot of what you've done, people haven't even noticed or even acknowledged. In fact, sometimes the, your efforts have been uh, not only not appreciated, they've been actually, people have been mean to you and unkind to you, the very ones you were helping. And it and didn't stop you doing the very best you can, but you never were doing it for them. You're always doing it for the Lord and for the right reason, and God will reward you for that. You had to stretch your dollar very hard and fast. You couldn't, you couldn't accommodate everything. It's so always you have to be very careful. And God wants to raise up a little support for you because you really are like the old woman who lived in the shoe, had so many kids who didn't know what to do. So you always have, a, you always have extra. There's always more, and you're not done yet. It's really like an orphanage you have almost. It's a real strange thing how you'll help and do and be a real mama and not only give guidelines and provide, you'll give them the love they need and the understanding and the push. You're a pusher. You will push people into where they're supposed to go. They cannot sit there and feel sorry for themselves. You'll keep them going. And that's your motivation gift that you have. And you're, God's going to raise up a financial support to make you give you the ability to do what you do, but you're just always struggling to get it quite there where you want to go. And he'll take care of that financially for you. That's what I'm hearing the Lord saying. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, that's what I wanted to do, the band, the band. All right. What's your name again, sir? The one that's the singing? Jody. Jody. What's, your, what's your last name? Wilson. Mr. Wilson. And this is your wife next to you? Wow. She's so pretty. I guess she must have thought you had money or something. <laughs> Somebody convinced her. How many children do you have? Four, Four kids. That's great. Four kids. Uh, that's a good number. Then you will fit right in here, right? <laughs> so what do you do for a living? You know, pastor, and you do the worship and so on. It's very clear to me when I hear you sing, not the musical talent, but the heart for the Lord. You really have a clean hands and clean heart, and I really appreciate and enjoy that the most because that's what really makes a real worshiper, someone who loves the Lord and puts him first, not the ability to sing or play the harmonica or anything else, but to be a man of God. Uh, I do see that uh, you've had so many aspirations of writing songs and, and all that, but really your real gift is to is to pastors, to nurture, is to help people. And music is one of the tools that you'll do it for. Uh, even though you've written so many songs, and some are like, okay, it's not your destiny to write, be a songwriter. It's your destiny to make an impact on people's lives. And many of the lives you'll touch will become great preachers themselves. You'll have a ripple effect the rest of your life because you take time. You have a great patience with children. You will take time and you will talk to them as if they're adults. And God really appreciates that because he himself was very patient and very attentive to kids. Uh, my sister, you love him because he's really a good guy in so many ways, and, and um, you've been a real strength to him, but you're not a pushover in any way. You know what you want, and you've got a strong will, and you keep the whole ship running, to keep a tight ship. That home runs very smoothly, and it's going to be this way or, or the highway, and you keep it going right. And uh, God gave that because sometimes he will make, he'll always have room for more, always help everybody. He doesn't know how to say no. He'll pick up all the strays, every stray in the universe. And so there has to be a little bit of guidelines. We're going to do so much at a certain time. All your children are blessed and very active. The house is never quiet. It's always a busy, busy little, when it, or they all sleep, it's a lot more 
user-friendly. But um, until then, it's a busy active. Your kids are wonderful. I don't know whether you're homeschool or not, but I do see eventually you'll be doing some of those things that will really generate a tremendous amount of spirituality in your own family. Thank you for being here today. If you didn't get a word today, it means you must let the pastor invite me again, and I'll come and prophesy some more. Please check those books out and stuff back there, please. Thank you so much for letting me come. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's let him know again how much we appreciate him. I can tell you just in the time that I've got to visit with him, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible when you get to sit down and listen to him and hear where he's been and and some of the places that he's been in and some of the things that he's done, it, is, it makes it even more incredible to see the genuine appreciation. I mean, I, I, I know what I have experienced with him before in the past. And so I truly, I mean, I wish I could think of a cooler word than giddy. But I've been giddy about bringing him here and sharing him with you. And the whole time he's been here, he's done nothing but express to me how much he's appreciated being here. And so uh, we, you just don't get an opportunity to have an encounter with, with godly men like that that often. And so I just am so thankful that he's been here, and I'm looking forward to him coming back and doing our second prophetic conference at this time next year. It'll be, it'll be even more powerful. You guys can expect to, to be a part of that. It's going to be awesome. We want to close out the service now. I want to pray for us as we go. I want to just pray that all of the words that have been spoken here would, would really resonate with your heart and that you, every one of you, would leave here today with your cup being full, that your cup would run over. And I, I want to close out this time again just like this morning. So I had so many people ask, hey, I really would like to be able to give into his ministry. Uh, I want to give you a chance to do that. You can close out. You can, if you have an offering you want to give into his ministry, we, want, we certainly want to give you the opportunity to do that. And so uh, it, it w- we'll open this up and let you, let you bring that up here at the front. So I just want to pray favor of us as we close. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you've done here today. Thank you for what you did here last night. Father, I thank you for the hearts that were touched, the words that were spoken, the incredible, the incredible life that came out of the words. I thank you for the incredible life that we had in our worship experience. God, it's been so good. I pray that your words would, would change our hearts and that it would, it would be ever-changing, that those words that we would understand truly, that words of life were spoken into us and that those words of life don't just fall to the ground, but they constantly work in us. And let those words be ever-shaping and, and constantly molding us into what you have called us to be. So we love you. We bless you in this place, Father. We look so forward to what you're going to do. We thank you for what you've done. But God, we are on the edge of our seat looking so forward to what you're going to do here and what you're going to do in our lives. We celebrate you tonight. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.